Okay, guys. Thank you for joining us as we uh, wrap this up. You know, I'm, you, were, you were in here for the last question that I think was asking about, you know, the diversity, what's going on. And, and Dave, I want to start with you. How would you answer that question? I'm actually really happy you answered it because I was sitting there on the side over there saying, I wish I got this question. Ah. <laughs> um, so it actually brings up a couple of points. First of all, I actually think one of the biggest issues in things like food and agriculture is it's filled with so much misinformation. Mm. And I think people are making decisions where they're operating on not just misinformation, but almost a degree of deception. So for example, I'm sure there's a number of people in this audience who eat things like chicken. Chicken, of course, is sprayed in its own feces, mm -hmm. not something people tend to think about. The <laughs> amino acids that make up the meat are so low quality that it's treated like sugar. Mm -hmm. Yet, we think of chicken as a good food to eat. And it's, it's really something that's, that's become something that, it, it, because we do it, we continue to do it. I look at things like the microbiome in not so much of a different way. So what's the biology of the microbiome? Well, if you look at ancestral crops, they had about 10 times as many bacterial and fungal species as modern crops. Right. Now, what's interesting is if you take humans who exist in non-urbanized, and I mean the, the ultra-rural, indigenous type, uh, type people, mm -hmm. and you look at their microbiomes, they're about 10 times as diverse as people who live in the United States. You take them out, their microbiome within about seven days reduces in diversity, mm. and their autoimmune disease goes up. So what's really interesting when we think about the microbiome of crops? Well, you see the same thing that you saw in humans that leads to disease. Right. Perhaps what it means today in our modern system is we're actually feeding people diseased crops. And the notion that we can actually restore health by providing back a microbiome gives us a new handle on thinking about what is health, what is a healthy plant. Now, I'm not an advocate of growing food in a dish. That be, but that being said, I am an advocate of thinking about how can we make agriculture better? How can we make it healthier? How can we make it something that can actually be less, de uh, less destructive to land uh, and something that can actually be sustainable much longer than the 60, say, cycles that's anticipated? This is why I knew that when you raised microbiome, he was the right guy to ask <laughs> uh, in that question. And, I, and I, th you know, I was reading about one of your companies that you've invested in is actually going through 40,000 different microbes and finding out which of those might have positive impacts. As I understand it, you're painting it on seeds or something of the sort. <laughs> How's that going? Very, very well. Um, well, that's my short answer. Yeah. Uh, the, the longer answer is, so it's turned out we've been able to systematically uncover the nature of the microbiome in a whole set of crops, what's happened over time, and ways that we can improve all sorts of, um, uh, all, all sorts of traits in crops. And I use that word a little bit, um, uh, a little bit out of, out of proper use because we're not doing anything, say, genetic. There is no genetic modification. All we're doing is restoring some of the things that are associated with the older, if you will, healthier crops. And what it does is it leads to things like... It's like heirloom tomatoes, but it's heirloom people or heirloom microbi mm -hmm. microbiome. Well, you know, heirloom to yeah. me tends to mean old and handed down by... I mean, I know there's a different definition, yeah. but <laughs> I, I like to think of it as, as, as better. Uh. <laughs> Uh, let, let me ask you a question, uh, Emily, on, on what you've now taken on with the task. There was a great Fortune magazine article about how you wanted to change your life, you wanted to get back into the innovation of what was going on, create sustainable, clean tech growth and ag and, and, and broadly. Uh, and so you were hanging out with guys in a stuffy, uh, uh, forgotten manufacturing no plant. No ventilation. <laughs> Uh, and they said, well, you're cool. You know, you can be executive director at no pay unless you go get uh, your own salary. Which How is all of that going? Because it, 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 <laughs> you seem to have uh, uh, created a booming place of innovation in the, in the kind of clean space. Yeah, well, it's going great today. Um, we are the largest clean tech incubator in the United States, and agriculture is a very important part of the portfolio of companies that we work with. Uh, so Greentown Labs currently supports about 50 companies, and what they have in common mm. is that they're all solving really big problems about the en energy or the environment. And we particularly focus on companies different from the ones that Dave works with that are really doing things around hardware. Right. So we might be likely to support the drone company mm -hmm. that is looking at the crops from above or the IoT company that is trying to understand the analytics of how plants are growing, um, or a company that is building in-home aquaponic systems mm -hmm. um, and the app that goes to monitor those systems. So it's, it's a different um, subset in terms of the type of companies that we have, but very much um, it's a, just a fantastic community 
of folks that are interested in solving a very big problem. And, and are, I mean, I mean you've run it through a, f uh, a few of them, but maybe you could be a little bit more specific on the ag side um, as to whether any of these are getting the traction to scale. Yes, so we work with fairly early stage companies. So these folks are coming to us typically at the prototyping stage. I see. So, but they've had a round of funding already. Yes, they've typically right. had a round of seed funding. And they come to us and they work in our laboratory building prototypes, testing prototypes, evaluating prototypes, uh, testing prototypes in a real world environment, talking to customers. And then that action, which often takes about two years, mm. really is what enables them to launch the company and to be able to raise the round of investment that say would be five to $15 million that and gets them out Dave of the incubator. And you call Dave and say, hey, you want to, have you bought any of their companies yet? Have you guys met before? We've, we've yes. definitely met before. We haven't been investing as actively in clean tech recently, but mm -hmm. back in the day, we used to cross paths uh, quite a bit. Where do you see the opportunities that, that you think are emerging uh, in the ag arena that, that might not be commonplace to us? I mean, I think there's a number of different places. So some that are more of the obvious things that people are thinking about, which is uh, opportunities around what does gene editing and the future of gene editing mean, opportunities around uh, data and how that can actually be applied more systematically. Mm -hmm. um, but what's partly getting interesting, what's getting really interesting is um, despite the fact that very good people have been working in this area for a long time, we're actually just starting to understand the components of biology that actually go into a plant. And I think as we start understanding more and more pieces of the biology, we're going to be able to have better control over uh, what ultimately can happen, how strong a plant can be, what it ultimately can do. Um, we'll get into really interesting questions of what actually defines a plant as a plant or a species as a species. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's going to take us into some very fun spaces. You know, one of the questions I didn't get into with the last panel um, and, and would have liked to is, is innovation in the food waste um, space, mm -hmm. which is... Uh, something Emily works on quite a bit, but but it raises the interesting question is as, as we think about greater production, better seeds, uh, transferring technology to Africa, uh, being sensitive to the to the microbiome or diversity of that area. You know, th that's an entirely different conversation. I just wonder if you could put that on hold for five years, all <laughs> those things, whether there would be more attention that was all of a sudden focused on the staggering levels of food waste and what was going on there. And I'm just interested in whether either of you kind of deal with that and whether there is a relationship or not in terms of our success. Because I would say 90% of the discussions I've had are always on how to increase yield, how to increase productivity, how, mm -hmm. to, how to do it better, how to, how to do some of these other things. Very, very little on the food waste side. Is that your sense? I'd say that there actually are quite a few companies out there who are addressing this problem. I don't think that we have one today at Greentown Labs, although we do have companies working in waste area in general and trying to reuse that waste in some way. So mm. for example, reusing methane waste from a landfill. Um, but I think there are a lot of opportunities in that area. And so I would definitely say if you're an entrepreneur that knows about a way to, or has an idea to solve this problem, the ground is open for you. Dave, what do you think about this? So a couple components on it. One, the, the broad waste area is something we have thought about a lot of. We haven't done much in the space, and it's for a couple reasons. It's not to say it's not important, uh, because as Emily said, there are people who are working on this. There are people who are thinking about it. Um, it opens up one question, which actually goes back to your question a bit, of separating food versus nutrition. Right. Because mm -hmm. if you think about extracting out nutrients, then waste actually becomes a really good place to be able to find high density nutrition. Mm. But the second is, and at the end of the day, we are, and we, we're, a, we're a company that's creating new technologies, investing in them, but we have our own investors who we're supposed to deliver a re return to, and so we need a path by which we can see financial success. The value chain in waste has been more challenging, and it suffers from a problem that I call, um, sorry for the crudeness of it, the who cares problem, mm. which is if you solve the, the food waste problem, the real question is, who's going to take notice? And I'm not talking about writing a, a piece about how important this is, because it is, and it is important, but there aren't people who are there paying for it and painting over it such that they'll pay disproportionately. When you see that pain point that causes people to do unnatural things, that makes for a very good investment opportunity. And that's why there's a lot more on the supply side, because you can see who needs it. You can see the answer to the who cares question.
Let me ask you both about the ecosystem for research and support here. Dave, I know you've got a, more than 200 patents out there. You've got a successful incubator in the clean tech space. A lot of people in the audience interested in ag, which is so surprising to me in Boston, and maybe that's my own <laughs> uh, ignorance. But, but our, our, I mean, it, part of, I think, why we're doing this here is to bring people together, look at what some of the deficits may be, uh, and how to uh, stimulate even more innovation thinking out right, right here in this area and region. And, and given the fact that you've both been phenomenally successful, but let me just you know, say, if you were to push higher, if you were to work with people in the room, what are some of the missing things here that you'd like to see fixed that might enhance uh, innovation in the ag area in, in the Northeast uh, Boston area? I'd say, that, so the biggest challenge, which is also the biggest opportunity, is that Boston is the single greatest space for biotech. Hmm. The traditional space for biotech has been to take you into drugs and secondarily right. into devices and other sorts of health tech type innovations. And the good news is, um, unless something massively changes over the next handful of years, it is a robust industry. It's one that we care about. It's one where diseases have not been right. getting better. Um, and that takes people away from thinking about ag. Mm. Um, the reason that's also a good thing though, is one of the best places for ag innovation mm. is biotech innovation. And I think what we're starting to see is a slope that's allowing for a translation of these insights much faster into agriculture. So if we think about recombinant technologies mm. going into drugs right. versus agriculture, there was, a, there was a delay. If you think about the delay between drugs and agriculture for CRISPR, we have right. CRISPR products on the market. We don't right. have CRISPR drugs on the market, right. CRISPR ag products. And so you said we're about, fifth, there's a lag of about 15 years, right? Is that it had been, but right. I think that lag time is cutting back pretty, pretty, it's actually getting a lot better such that the translation's happening faster. And, and, and as you look at this area, what do you think would be um, either, I mean, it could, sometimes it can be just, just inspiration, sometimes it can actually be working with the city, the county, research, whatever, but what do you feel that would be an enhancer to the kind of work you do? Well, I think that a lot of the work that is done in agriculture, a lot of the research work is actually done in universities that are in the middle of the country and mm -hmm. kind of closer to the farm. So a lot of the innovation So is being close to the farm is something you don't have here? I would say um, we're maybe not as close to the farm as uh, some of the Midwestern universities that would be, you know, having these uh, various extension programs that are uh, typically a way that some of that innovation gets out into the market. I think we are, like Dave said, very strong in the biotech side, mm. um, but I know that the folks that we have uh, within Greentown Labs are often, you know, kind of going elsewhere to be inspired or to talk directly to folks that are um, really kind of relevant to what they're building. So, I mean, that said, I think Boston and uh, this area is building a mm. strong ecosystem in the ag space. And just before I go to the audience, Dave, you had, you had some, we were, I read this wonderful, these, I mean, you, you seem to be uh, at least off stage, very irreverent and iconoclastic and in your face, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, uh, and, and said we ought to really, really be eating crickets uh, rather <laughs> than chickens. And, and you, in, in what I've read about you, you, it sort of seems to be imbued with this notion that you think that we have a lot of you know, false uh, illusions about our food space and that, that, that we, we could benefit from revisiting a lot of these things and tearing down some of these myths. And I'm, I'm interested in, I don't know, just give me two, two, other three or, uh, two or three other zingers, uh, mm -hmm. uh, if you will, in terms of what you think the barriers to our own imaginations are as we think about the ag space. Uh oh, that, that really feels like it's putting me on the spot there. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, I mean, I do. I 100% I agree. Ag is filled with a bunch of misperceptions. Um, I'll, I'll just mention a couple things, just as his, his, some historical components. Uh, and um, so, one, for example, uh, people always take this firm view on genetic, mo genetically modified organisms, GMOs, right. uh, as being good or bad. Now, when you go back, part of the reason that GMs actually existed was Monsanto was trying to shove GM down the throat of the French grocery stores. Mm. And the GM concept came up as a basis for these grocery stores pushing back against Monsanto. It wasn't that it was good or bad, but as a result of that pushback, it became a good or bad thing, and it was sort of a pseudo-organic versus non-organic thing. The problem with that mm. is we don't actually have the real information, and it's become such a polarized debate that we don't know whether GMs are good or are bad. Mm. I'm, and that's not my, it's not my opinion as to whether they're good or they're right. bad. 
But when we're facing real, t- real challenges with our food system, we really should right. know yeah. whether bio- biotechnology is a good thing or a bad thing. And now when we look at CRISPR, which is a really powerful tool, people talk a lot about how it should be regulated. The best part about it, because all of the rules about biotech regulation were written decades ago, you can get around all of them, and I could rewrite a whole genome without it being genetically modified hmm. by definition. Sort of a crazy little thing that, that's showing up in the space, but it's getting to this point where people are asking these questions of, am I innovating for the betterment of mankind, or am I innovating to get around laws? And right. unfortunately in ag, we do a little too much of the latter. Interesting. Any final thoughts on this subject? I think that there are lots of opportunities for entrepreneurs out there to tackle this area. And so I would encourage anyone that has an idea to just go forth. And you've got good support resources here in Boston. You have places like the incubator that we run, but there's also a number of different groups out there that are really uh, collectively growing this ecosystem here. That's great. Let me go to the audience and take questions, comments. Yes, right here. We're going to bring you a mic. Okay, uh, I have to apologize. This one actually goes back to some, some earlier stuff. We're, we're going to bring you the microphone right here. Yeah. yeah. Just hand it over there. Be great. Uh, I have to apologize. And, this and one, tell us who you are. Hey, Sarah Tabor. Uh, I do a lot of operations consulting with a lot of your indoor ag startups. Um, this one goes back to a little bit of the, um, the ethical issues we've been talking about. Right. And it does relate to entrepreneurship as well. Um, when we're talking about ethical concerns, a lot of it tends to focus around IP and what that means for companies and entrepreneurs as they develop. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't see a lot of discussion of the ethics of the, the human outfall of innovation and how that changes people's relationship to production. Um, I actually see a lot of good potential in there. So I really mm-hmm. want to see uh, Indorag talk about that more. I'll give you an example. When I was a postdoc, um, Part of my job was working in, in field genetics right. with blueberries. Mm-hmm. I was working with a convict labor crew. That was who my work crew was. That's who they gave me to work with. Right. Um, that was because, again, agricultural labor is something that people really want to be cheap because the business models in agriculture require that. You see now with poli- political stuff going on, um, there's a loss of that cheap labor supply where he's going build the wall. They're trying to cut immigrant labor down. Right. What I'm seeing is someone who works in agriculture Folks think that's going to lead to higher paying agricultural jobs. What it's really leading to is more prisoner labor. And that's building a situation where there's more economic incentive for mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. So what I see the potential... So your question... So my question is, um, is there anybody who's looking at the ethical implications of, hey, we have modes of production that enable us to pay more jobs, to have better jobs as a result of automation? People freak out about, oh, we're going to lose jobs, but they, don't f- they forget that those jobs we're losing kind of belong to prisoners with jobs. Right, right. Um, is there anybody talking about that, I guess is my question. So I have thoughts on that, but I'll turn to you, Dave, first, and, and, and your thoughts on, on this question of progress versus the tensions it creates. Yeah, it's, it's, always an interesting ch- it's, it's always an interesting challenge to be thinking about. I mean, I think people always do try to figure out what is technology going to do positively and negatively. And I think for the lion's share of our, our time in the past of estimating these things, we've always gotten about 100% wrong. Mm. Um, so from my standpoint, I always try to think about what is the worst thing that can happen. But when you're making your decisions, just assume that they're going to be, I, I always think you make the decisions that you, you know are wrong, but are hopefully not bad wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, people are thinking about that, but there's a lot of pieces that go into some of these elements. So the government, for example, has done a very good job of dealing with some of what's happened historically in ag by... Uh, allowing small farms to survive. There's a strong interest in having small farms. It's important for society. It's important for rural communities. Um, A big part of the reason that organic exists as a label is to support farms under 25,000 acres. Um, So I think there is some thinking about it. It's not an area where innovation has traditionally played the primary role because the effects are so downstream that you can't necessarily anticipate it. And the speed of, I hate saying it in this way, the speed of some of the random government activities that we might see in the short term are way faster than the innovation cycle of being able to have its its impact on the markets, uh, even though it's usually the other way around. So I think people are thinking about it, but not quite the way you're describing. Emily, quick reaction? I think people are absolutely thinking thinking about that really across clean tech um, in terms of robotics especially. But there can be benefits um, as well. I mean, you look at, we have other companies who are working in on uh, developing robotics that are going to replace workers in a warehouse, right? So you may be replacing jobs there, 
but you are actually reducing the energy costs. You are reducing the amount of energy used. You are reducing the amount of lighting needed, the amount of heating needed. So sometimes there can be trade-offs, and I think that that's important to think through. I, I would say, I mean, I, one, I'm glad you're asking those questions, and I think there's probably more action there than, than it looks. I mean, one of the interesting things, on the, again, this industrial farm I looked at, they installed these, um, one of these in Israeli innovations on uh, through the ground um, irrigation. So rather than irrigation from above, it's irrigation that basically seeps through balloon-like things in the ground. It's very fascinating. And on the eastern shore of Maryland, it's remarkable because there's not a, a, a particular shortage of water there, but you have lots of problems of runoff and other kinds of things. And, and you can put that within the ethical context. One of the areas what I've been uh, interested in is the area of a autonomous vehicles down the road uh, and the four million mm -hmm. uh, lesser educated, mostly men, uh, not all men, who drive trucks. And this is going to be an area with huge displacement. So it, again, raises the question of what are those public? I think every area that you begin to think of drives these impacts and concerns, and it raises eventually concerns of how do you assess the, you know, as you said, people's relationship with food, which you were talking about, or people's relationship with farms. And I think that the conversations are very important. So I want to thank you. To it. Let me take one last question. Yes, sir, right here. Hi. I'm Pat Christianitis, and I'm an ag salesman. And a comment and a question. Yes, sir. Um, first with David, there are a lot of misperceptions in agriculture. And 40 years ago, when I was at school at UMass, they knew all about the microbial population. There wasn't money to be made in it, hmm. which is the difference today. UMass still promotes good agriculture is good biological um, diversity. But for Emily, the reason for the funding in the Midwest universities for a lot of the innovations, isn't that because of the commodities market and the mm. acreage out there versus the smaller acreages on the coast? Quick thoughts on microbial awareness uh, way back when. Thoughts, Dave? Yeah, so it, it's a great point. Uh, I always separate discovery from innovation uh, mm. because it is important to re recognize the discovery. I'll give a quick example of just something even more extreme. Uh, the importance of bacteria in cancer has been mm. recognized going back to the 1850s. Mm. Um, that's never been acted upon until a company now doing it and will be in the, for the first time in clinical trials next year. Uh, so to me, there's this question of how do you take these understandings and insights and actually do something that productizes them or brings mm. them in a way that can be useful. So it's obviously a really important recognition. Uh, we view our roles as being innovators as opposed to the original scientific discoverers. Uh, but again, it's important and I'll just just make one more comment. Um, great that you're, you're from UMass. I think one of the things, going back to one of the previous questions that's really important here, we've had a huge influx of the healthcare companies come into this area, and that's been great for us building an ecosystem here. Mm -hmm. What we haven't yet had is the same sort of infl influx in the agriculture companies, mm -hmm. uh, which gets a little bit to your other point, and I think that will be great for uh, continuing innovation in that space as well. Emily? Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm really sharing the experience of some of our startups. Um, so that's, that's the um, information that I have about um, kind of where the innovation is coming from. So it's kind of a first-hand source. Let me just ask you real quickly, both you know, one of the other things is sometimes we're looking for celebrity geniuses. Uh, Walter Isaacson's just written about Da Vinci, but he wrote about Steve Jobs. Um, I was learning around one of the uh, great uh, uh, vaccine uh, creators, um, uh, who's, who developed more than uh, 40 different vaccines out there. In the ag space, is there, uh, other than yourselves, a genius that we should know about that uh, uh, is, is, is going to be life altering? Well, I have to comment on two companies. Mm -hmm. uh, Raptor Maps, who is uh, a company that is doing uh, aerial farm analytics, right. uh -huh. as well as Grove Labs, who is doing um, home growing Grove systems. Grove Labs yes. and Raptor? Raptor Maps. Raptor. And tell me what Grove is doing? Um, home growing systems. Home growing systems. Yes. So back into the home, mm -hmm. like 3D printing at home. Right? Absolutely. So, okay, good. And, and Dave? I, the first name that came to my head when you, when you put that out there was Norman Borlaug. Um, and I'm trying to think about who the modern equivalent is, but I think we're waiting to see. Uh, interesting. Well, thank you very much, David Berry with Flagship and Emily Reichert with Greentown Labs. Thank you both very much for this conversation. <laughs>